Hi, this is Joe Crown, and I am a New Orleans-based, New Orleans-style piano player and organ player, and you're listening to Talkin' Blues. So I'm curious about, you're on the road, this is, you've been on the road for two weeks with Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Yep. Uh, tonight is the last night of the, this portion of the tour. How, how do you feel? Like, how does the last night feel to you? Well, the last night of all tours <laughs> is always, you know, um, uh, you're ready to go home. And even if I'm out for, say, 50 days, when you know, it's, when you know you're looking at home the next day, it's, it, you want to get home. Okay, if I'm out for two days, it's you're looking to get home. But I'll say this much, you know, I know about uh, Massey Hall, and we're real excited to be playing there. Um, it's a it's a world class venue, and anytime we go into any of these kind of world class venues, like you know, so, say something like the Beacon Theater or Ryman Auditorium, this I, I consider Massey right up there with that. And anytime we we go into those kind of venues. It's there's a certain extra level of excitement that we have, so I'm I'm pretty excited about playing the show tonight, just because I know that this is going to be one of those venues that it's just going to be real exciting. And I, you know, I know these the crowds that come out to these kind of places. Well, crowds that come out for Kenny Wayne Shepherd shows are always supercharged, so it's always fun. And I, I mean, I, I love playing in the band, and I love the environment that that we get to play in. It's it's a concert hall every night that's filled to the brim with very excited fans that are there exclusively to hear us, which is always a great feeling. Um, I wonder, in a two-week tour, I don't know, because you've been with a band for a while now, how much preparation goes into something like this, this leg of the tour? Is there rehearsals ahead of time, or do you well, do that? Well, um, uh, a lot of times we do, like, if we need to go over anything, we do it during sound check. But this this tour was uh, particularly a little bit different than a lot of the ones that we were, say, doing last year. Kenny just released a new CD um, at the end of last year. So this at this particular tour, we added some new material. We added a couple of horn players to the show. Mm -hmm. So um, when we started, we, we took a break from, you know, around the beginning of November until... Uh, the end of January. When we got back together to start working in January, um, we got together in Nashville and did a couple of days, a few days of rehearsal, and just just so that we can uh, acclimate the horn players and and just tighten up the show with the new material because it's a different set list. And I mean, we we change the set list every. I, I've been with Kenny for about seven years now, and we change the set list for every tour. You know, um, every time we come to different areas, we don't want to keep playing the same show. Right. So Kenny adds songs and pulls songs out out of the out of the show, but they're usually you know just um, songs from different songs from the current CD or pulling something out of the archive or something like that, just to make the show a little different. But anytime he's got a new CD out, um, we always get together and rehearse it and and go over things and. We talk about stuff a lot, and any time that we need to tweak anything, we do it during sound check, and we go through stuff. I mean, you know, we we there are a lot of YouTube's posted, and there's a lot of things that we can access the shows from previous nights. So if there's any questions about stuff, we we'll, we'll bring it up during sound check because because we go through and sound check, you know, pretty thoroughly um, songs for all the different instruments that we have on stage. And if there's any question about anything that went on or anything like that, we run over it during sound check. Just that's how we kind of re rehearse it. But it's it's definitely a a very deeply thought out show, and it's uh, um, you know it's it's definitely rehearsed. You know, I mean, in that sort of way. Okay, so I know that you're one of the busiest musicians in New Orleans. You have a lot of different gigs. As, whether it be solo or with your combo or your trio. Yeah, I stay busy. Um, I presume there's a lot more improvisation involved in that type of show. 
Well, um, yeah, it is. Um, do you prefer that? I guess my question is, which do you prefer when it's a set show with cues and? Yeah, I mean, you know, the Kenny show is 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 it's a set show. There is some wiggle room, of course, when we get our little solo features, we can wiggle a little bit on that. And or you know wiggle a lot, <laughs> but um, it's definitely you know we're gonna we're gonna do this amount of times of this and that amount of times of that, you know when I play with my own band it's very loosey goosey in that sort of way and we go with the moment a lot, and sometimes it kind of goes on a little bit longer than it should or sometimes it doesn't build the way we would like it to. And sometimes we we come up with things that are just so much, you know, elevated that the music grows, um, and that that sort of thing is is always been fun for me. You know, just watching how uh, certain songs over time have grown into different animals, and I, I do enjoy that. And it's something that is. Um, uh, I, I try to do as much as possible, especially when I play solo, because, you know, you're sitting there by yourself playing piano. It's not too far away from practicing. And, you know, I, I always try to come up with something different. And when, when you're playing solo, I mean, I can end the song short. I can go into a song in the middle of the song. I can do whatever I want with it. So, I mean, those kind of things... If I feel real inspired in the moment, I can really go off on tangents. I mean, guys like James Booker would start playing classical music in the middle of a song or start quoting Beatles songs in the middle of a, you know, I mean, anything like that. And so, I mean, solo, you can do a lot more variety with it. Um, the more pieces you add, the more you really have to stick to, like, the, 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 the script on that. You know, I, I did a lot of stuff for for several years where I was doing left hand bass, especially on organ. Mm -hmm. And when it came down to like, you know, you're in an organ trio. I had an organ trio for about a year or two with a harmonica player named Jason Ricci. Mm -hmm. So when it came time for my feature, it was just me and the drums. So I mean, I could I, I realized at that point, you know, I could I could change songs in the middle of it, and I would. You know, in the, we're we're doing like kind of like a New Orleans groove, and I'll just start playing Mardi Gras in New Orleans in the middle of it. You know, um, it's a lot different when you have another harmony instrument like a guitar player, but like when you're doing an organ trio or just a piano trio with drums, keyboard, and sax or something like that. You know, I mean, just in the middle of the song, I can just break into anything I want. <laughs> so that you have that you have that freedom. Um, and sometimes that's that's good, and, and it's nice to have that experimental element. And some, like anything else, sometimes it's, well, that didn't quite work that well. You know, I won't do that again kind of thing. How did the piano come into your life? Um, I started playing piano. We had a piano in the house when I grew up. So I started playing piano when I was seven. And it was one of those things where it was in the house, and I just kept sitting at it. As I remember uh, as a child that I was just try to play it and my mom just finally said hey would you want lessons and I was like sure I'll try that and you know through my whole childhood I took piano lessons and some years it was a very heavy focus in my daily routine and some years I was distracted by you know teenage um, activities we'll call it <laughs> um, and I was less focused on it but when I got into college I really um really bear down and made it like a, a thing you know that I did every day all the time kind of so was it related to your college studies or not at first okay you went you to know, Buffalo or did you not I went to SUNY Buffalo State University in New York and Buffalo which is just right over the border here yeah. and um you know when I grew up uh the thought of becoming a musician was it was not a desirable thing for uh, your children to do and my parents were very much like look we know you want to do this but you really need the career as the fallback and play music on the side and you know being 17 and whatever 18 years old that was the plan and I went to SUNY Buffalo for an electrical engineering degree and the more time I spent in college, the less I did that and the more I did music. So by the time I was in my junior year, I quit. I quit 
college and I moved to Boston with a bunch of guys and we started a band over there and I spent 12 years in Boston just playing music and pr just pretty much playing music. I did some odd jobs at times, but you know, um, just trying to make make the, the the bills and everything like that. Um, I did what I had to, and I played in some some pretty straight up top forty cover bands. And this is in the eighties, so we were playing a lot of uh, post disco music and funk and things of that nature. Um, and just playing in hotels and, you know, five nights, six nights a week and making my bills that way. And then eventually I, I was able to get in and get my own band going and I got that going. And then I started working with some of the old blues guys. The first guy I started working with was uh, Luther Guitar Jr. Johnson. And that was in the late 80s that I did that. And um, that was my first experience really getting out of the New York, New England area. And we traveled in Europe, and we went to all over the country, drove everywhere, came up to Canada. We would play in Western Canada for a month at a time. We'd hmm. do a week in Edmonton, two weeks at the King Eddie in Calgary, <laughs> and then a, a week at the Yale Hotel in Vancouver. Edmonton always changed. We would do a week up there, but it was never the same place every time we went up. And... Uh, we had a nice little thing going there for a while, and then eventually, after a few years of doing that, I got called to join Clarence Gatemouth Brown's band. How did that? But well, sorry, before we go to that, um, while you were in Boston, did you not back up people like Chuck Berry? I did. And um, how did that happen? Uh, I I was working with a group of guys in Boston. Uh, one of the clubs I played at called the Tamashanter had a once a month jam. They called it the Tam Jam. And they put together a house band and it was me, bass player, guitar player, and drummer. And it was a jam that all the musicians, we play like a little set for about half an hour and then we would call musicians up to come sit in. And at that time, the drummer was a guy named Tom Hambridge who later who moved out of Boston and found his own course of fame, um, being a uh, an amazing record producer and the drummer for Buddy Guy's band. He moved to Nashville. And he's probably one of the top, if not the top, uh, blues record pr uh, producer at this point in time. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, he, ha he got the contract to um, back up Chuck. And it came down to uh, something where the promoter, Chuck's management told promoters when they hired Chuck in the New York and New England area to call Tom. And Tom had me, himself, and the bass player from the Tam Jam, a guy named Dave Broderick, as the backup band. And we played all over um, New York and New England backing up Chuck Berry. Um, what was that experience like to work with Chuck Berry? Chuck, it was it was fun. You know, first of all, it was like insane crowds and in playing a concert with a guy that was like, you know, legendary rock and roll Hall of Fame. You know, this this amazing guy. Mm -hmm. Chuck would show up about you know an hour to whatever the sound check was. He would show up dressed to the T in like a leather suit or something like that. And, you know, uh, he'd show up, we would do the sound check, he would disappear for about about an hour or so, and he would come back and he would dress in his red polyester jumpsuit, come out and play 60 minutes. At 60 minutes and 10 seconds, the show was over. At 61 minutes, he was out of the venue in his car off to the next place. And... Chuck, I have the one story that I have about playing with Chuck was that we had an experience where there was a problem with the back line and Chuck went hard line about it. And I'll never forget, we were playing in Buffalo at the Melody Tent. Hmm. And um, we got there and we did this, we came in for sound check and Chuck showed up and um, the promoter in his contract said he had to have do two dual showman fender amps because chuck had one of these i think it was a 3 355 which was the 
stereo version of the 335. Then he needed two amps, one on each side of the stage. They had to be dual showmans. Promoted did not have dual showman Fender amps. He had other kind of Fender amps. Chuck looked at the amps and said, These, the amps are wrong. The promoter said, that's all that we can find in Buffalo. This is the best we can find. I called everybody. There are no dual showman amps for rent. Chuck looked at the promoter and said, okay, I'm going to go out. When I come back, got to have the dual showman amps. And he left. We didn't even do the sound check. Now, mind you, the three of us in the band were just looking at each other like, you know, we're just a bunch of guys that, you know, we're not like, you know, his management or we don't travel with him and we don't know what happens in this situation. <laughs> and the promoter is like, what, what, what just happened here? So um, there was a comedian that went on before us. Comedian was on stage and Chuck wasn't anywhere to be found. And we're in the dressing room. The promoter's coming in and he's having kittens at this point. He doesn't know if Chuck is coming back. We don't know if Chuck is coming back. Finally, Chuck comes back, and Chuck is, the promoter comes in, you know, Chuck is pulling his guitar out, and the promoter comes in, he goes, he's got his red jumpsuit on, you know, he goes, so how'd it go? You got the amps? And the promoter's like, I told you this is the best, we, this is all we can do. And Chuck said, well, you got two choices. The contract says if you can't provide the amp, there's a $2,500 fine. You either provide the amp or you pay the money. And the guy's like, I don't have the money. You know, I mean, it's I don't carry that money around. Chuck starts putting his guitar away. <laughs> the promoter's like, hold up, hold up. I'm going to go to the box office. I'll see what, I, you know, I'll, I'll see what I can do. You know, comes back and he's got he's got a check for twenty five hundred dollars. Chuck is like, I don't know you. Contract says cash. He starts putting his guitar away again. And promoter goes, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let me go back to the box office. I'll, I'll talk to them about this. I'll see. What... Comes back with $2,500 in cash. And gives Chuck the money. And he goes, okay, we're going to have a show. And um, promoter leaves. And Chuck turned around and looked at us. And I will never forget it to this day. And he goes, I was not going to, I was always going to play the show. I just, you know, you just can't let these guys get away with this. This has happened to me all my life. You know, if they want this now, that's what they got to do, and they got to pay. You know, just know it. I got. They've already wired that my my fee for this is already in my bank account. There was no way I was going to cancel. I just had to hold a gun to his head figuratively to get what was right, rightfully due to me. And we went and we did the show that night, and we crushed it, and it was great. I, I wonder, as a young musician watching this. What, what what did you think about this whole thing? I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know, here's a man that probably did not see, he probably saw a fraction of his earnings. He's probably been messed with and screwed over his whole life, you know. I'm glad that he is actually able to stand up for himself at this point and and do what is contractually right. And he's he's tired of being screwed. And... I, I think it was great that he made the, that stand. And I wish that, like, you know, I mean, I don't see that kind of stuff happening to me because I'm not at that level. But, you know, I mean, it's just nice to see, you know, there's always somebody out there messing with us. Uh, I'm telling you, to this day, there's always somebody out there messing with us. I had a club mess with me in, in January. The club owner messed with me about something. I will never work there again. I will not t say who it is. But I had a really bad experience, and I will never work with the guy because he messed with me like that. And I wish I could have just walked up and, and said, like, you know, you, you, this is wrong. Either you do it's right or we're not going to play the show. And I just I had to think about what was best for, them, for, for the people in my band. And I ended up doing the show, and, you know, I'm just never going to do it again. And, I mean, it still happens to this day that musicians do get messed with like that. And I'm glad that somebody is out there saying that here's the line, you can't cross, if you, you can't cross it with me. And that was, that was a good thing. So by the time you, you're backing up people like Chuck Berry, um, are you thinking this is it, that this is what my career, this is what I'm going to do? 
Oh, I'm. I, I mean, as far as like being a side man to some people or musician period. Oh, I was I was a musician before, like full time musician before that. You know, by the time I was like in my early twenties, like twenty three, twenty four. I mean, I left college at twenty, and I was like, I hope I'm going to do this. But by the time I was like twenty three, twenty four, it's like there was no no way I was going to do anything else. You know. In fact, my parents were like, you know, when things were getting like a little bit rocky and I was starting to take, you know, do odd jobs and stuff like that. Um, I um, they were like, maybe you should think about going back to school and getting back on that original course. And I was like, mm -mm. no, it's not good. That's not going to happen. You know, I'm going to uh, I'm going to tough it out and. I mean, to this day, um, you know, this is the path I went down. And sometimes, you know, <laughs> when when I'm really tired or frustrated or things aren't going the way you want, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs being a musician. You know, there's the business of making music, and then there's the music business. And no matter what, there's always going to be some sort of disappointment um, and there are times that I, I'm like, I, I just never should have done this, you know, <laughs> but, but in, invariably the high moments are, are always there and they always are so many more than any kind of disappointments. And, um, it's, it's just hard, you know, it's your music is an art and, you know, when the business is, um, when the business is affecting your art kind of thing, when you're making a living off of your art and the business isn't where it should be with it, you know, it's, it's, it's a personal thing. You know, it's a lot different than like, you know, um, you know, the company didn't do this or, you know, we, the company didn't get this contract. It's a direct like, you know, thing about, about my art and who I am when I don't get on a festival or I don't, you know, get this this call when everybody else is getting the call. I'm left out. You know, I mean, those things always happen. And at, at this point in time in my life, you know, um, I kind of like have learned to accept it. I really don't have too much more to really like gain from anything. I'm just enjoying what I'm doing at this point. And I know that there's going to be things that I'll get and there's things I won't get. I just put out a new record last year. I'm real proud of it. And, you know, it, it got nominated for some awards. It didn't get nominated for some awards. Right. It didn't win any awards. But I don't even care at this point. It's it's one of these things. I guess I do care if I say, if I'm talking about awards. But, I mean, if if it doesn't get anything, I'm proud of the work. And it was a volume of work that I did that, I think is very representative of who I am, and I think it was a good product. You know, I got it. Uh, I got it to be the what I wanted it to be. If I would have met you when you're in your twenties and having committed to becoming a full time musician, and asked you what your goals might have been, or what you hope to get out of being a musician, how would you have answered that? Well, how would anybody in their 20s <laughs> answer any question like that? You know, good point. <laughs> unless you're Kenny Wayne Shepherd who was who was a prodigy and but right. making making platinum selling records when he was 17, you know, I mean <laughs> it's it's a hard question to answer. My my goals have always been to play music, um, to record, to be on tour, to to be backing up some great musicians and hopefully have my own sound and my own product out there in some sort of way and I'm pretty much you know I'm in my 60s now and I pretty much have have done that you know I've played with a whole bunch of musicians you know I mean artists that I'm you know have always idolized and I'm proud to say I've, I've worked with them um, you know I mean Chuck Berry and Luther and Gatemouth and Kenny and Mavis Staples and Charlie Musselwhite and uh, Alan Tucson and Dr. John and I mean just all the people that I've I've played with and done gigs with and done tours with and you know it's just I'm um, I'm glad I pretty much have played with er, done a gig somewhere with everybody all the people I've idolized in New Orleans whether it's you know 
Irma Thomas or, you know, Ernie Cato and Alan. I mean, Alan and I became friends. We we uh, we did we did a tour together. We actually what was the name of the hall we played up? Kerner Hall. Yeah, Kerner Hall. Yeah, it was gr- it was great. We did a we did a month long tour. It was Alan Toussaint and Nicholas Payton, who's a Grammy Award winning trumpet player, and my band with uh, Walter Wolfman Washington and Russell Batiste Jr. Um, we were the band, and we backed up uh, Alan. And Alan did his show. We backed him up, and then Nicholas did a show, and we backed him up, and. We did that for a month. I did a tour with um, Mavis Staples and the North Mississippi All Stars and Charlie Musselwhite for two months, and I played with all of them. You know, I did a solo set, and then I was in the band with the North Mississippi All Stars and backed them up and played all played with with Mavis. I mean, Mavis. You know, <laughs> um, it was it's it's been good. You know, I'm I'm not complaining about anything. Uh, I definitely have had my share of stuff. I'm, of course, there's always something. There's always other rings to get, but you know, I'm I've I've definitely have gotten what I feel has been my share, and I've I've worked hard to be where I am, and I I'm glad I'm with Kenny. I really enjoy playing um, music with Kenny Wayne Shepherd. He's an amazing musician, and you know, I mean. There's a lot of really great blues guitar players, younger blues guitar players, and I mean younger like Kenny's Kenny's age group, and and then even younger than that like people like um, Samantha Fish and Ali Venable, and you know people in that age group, and um, you know and Ken, Kenny's an amazing guitar player, mm-hmm. hands down, one of the best, if not the best blues or, or that style guitar players in the world right now I mean he's right up there if not better than than Joe Bonamassa Eric Gales Walter Trout I think he's he's amazing I play behind the guy every night I can't say enough good stuff about him as a guitar player but the thing that really sets him uh, apart from some of the other guys is his songwriting mm-hmm. He's, he, he can write some songs. That Blue on Black, that's his biggest song. I mean, it's amazing. It's not amazing. It's, it's a great song. It's understandable why it sold so many records, why it continues to sell. He, he recut it with a, a, there was a metal band called Five Finger Death Punch that did a version of it about five years ago. That just went platinum, sold over a million copies at the beginning of the year. The video had something I think 245 million views, and the, and uh, understandably it has Brian May from Queen, Brantley Gilbert, Five Finger Death Punch, Kenny Wayne Shepherd. I mean, star studded, but that's his song. Mm-hmm. I'd like to have a song that 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 had a thousand views, you know. And this guy's got you know 245 million views and. That's that to me is what set, separates Kenny from a lot of these other people. And night after night, especially on Blue, on, I, I watch people singing all of his songs, and especially Blue on Black. We do the thing like like the country artists do, where they, the band stops and and the audience sings. Right. And they all, I mean, it's it's an achievement, and that's what I think kind of sets him apart from a lot of the other. Um, really amazing guitar players out there and they're all amazing and Kenny is is equally as good if not one I would say he's one of the best if not the best I, at, I at agree in the, in the way that a lot of people especially the younger players might want to just do lots of solos but Kenny certainly has the ability to write and has written some great songs he also yeah. does a lot of covers which I find interesting he does from time to time but you know um uh the bulk of his show is is his own music, but we do covers. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, if he likes a song, um, uh, we'll, we'll we'll do it on on the new record. He does um, Saturday, uh, Saturday night, night yeah. the Elton John tune. You know, um, uh, what was that tune we did? Um, da, 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 uh, I can't remember the name of it. There was another cover. I think it was a Joel Walsh tune that we did. Um, but I think throughout his career, I think I, yeah. I don't know if it, every album, but he picks songs and, and kind of makes it his own. He know? does. Yeah. He does. And and he he definitely um 
he uh, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be just like, you know, oh, Kenny, 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 but because I work with him yeah. and I stand behind him every night and he really is deserving of what everything that he gets. He really is an amazing talent. And the amazing thing about it is, is like, you know, I have to go and learn all this music. And sometimes we pull stuff out of the archives when he was like, you know, 16 and 17 when he wrote. I mean, he wrote Blue on Black 27 years ago. I think he was like 18 or 19 when he wrote that. And it's like, you know, he's writing that stuff when he was a kid. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's that's the kind of thing. And I'm going back and learning some of these songs and listening to him play when he was like 17 and 18. I'm like, it's amazing, you know. <laughs> and I, I, I guess it is when you're that. Um, when you reach that kind of level that like, you know, that when you're that young, you, you hit it like that. Um, but he's, he's great. And, you know, we've done shows with, with Joe Bonamassa. He's, he's great. He's got a great show really, you know, um, all these guys, Eric Gales. I mean, that, that guy is, he's, he's from another planet. I mean, he plays so uniquely and so amazing. Um, Walter Trout, like these these other people I mentioned, Walter Trout, he's he's great. I mean, you know, great. These are great guitar players, and and you know, Kenny shoulder to shoulder with any one of them, he can stand up there and match him note for note. Well, or at least for excitement, excitement to each one of them. And you know, the the thing that I think that uh, that I always and I've told this to Kenny many times. It's like his songwriting is. You know, definitely at a different level than than a lot of these other um, guitar uh, uh, virtuosos that are out there. Um, I want to get back to how you joined the band, but before that, I want to go back a few years to you playing with one of the greats, Gatemouth Brown. Sure. How did that happen? Um, I was with Luther Guitar Junior Johnson, and at the time, um, Gate was booked by the same agent as um luther was gate had to do some shows up in canada up here mm -hmm. and as you know the border crossing is can be a little bit challenging with air quotes around it mm -hmm. um and he had gate had a guy in the band that had issues getting across the border and couldn't take him across the border and he was playing up in New England, and they needed a keyboard player. So the agent uh, gave them my number to go up and do some shows. And I did, I did uh, some shows in Montreal and Ottawa with Gate. And that was in 1991. And from there, I kind of stayed in touch with Gate and, or, or with, his, with his people and told them uh, I would be interested if a full-time job came open. You know, I mean, I wasn't really interested. I was working with Luther. So, I mean, if I, I said I would fill if I could, but if a full time job opened, I would be interested. And within about six months, a full time job did open. I did go up and and then I joined the band. I moved to New Orleans in 1992. I moved to New Orleans and became his full time piano player. And I traveled literally all over the world with gate for 15 years until well 14 years until he died i played with him for 15 but i was in the band for 14 and he died right after hurricane katrina in 2005 and we played everywhere we opened up for eric clapton for a year we did about 60 shows all over europe and the united states which was fabulous uh been to japan a few times with gate been all over europe with gate uh Went to Africa with Gate, Australia with Gate. Um, you know, we can't. I can't even tell you how many times we crisscrossed the country. You know, in those many years, it was all the time. You know, we were doing probably about somewhere between around a hundred shows a year with Gate, which meant I was on the road about a hundred and fifty days or so. Um, tell me about that experience and how you saw him as. A band member, as a band leader, as a musician. Well, Gate had specific things that he wanted to have happen. Um, he definitely did not want me to play anything that sounded like New Orleans piano. <laughs> he liked more of the Count Basie kind of stuff. Right. And he definitely directed towards that. Um, 
when I played blues, he wanted um, more of uh, like, you know, like slow blues and stuff. He, he liked the traditional blues styles, but he really kind of strayed away from that. For people that knew Gate, he had a very kind of like gruff uh, exterior, and he did not like to be considered a, a blues artist because he was more than a blues artist. He looked at blues artists like Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker that were very basic, stripped-down uh, versions of the blues. Gate came out of the big band era in the 40s, and not only did he play big band blues, I mean, he was one of the orig original guys that did that, but he also played some big band music. And we did a couple of records, Gate Swings and American Music Texas Style, where we had 12 horns, and we went for the big band sound. And it was more of a jump blues kind of thing. And, and Gate was like one of the guys, I mean, T-Bone was, was kind of the first guy. Gate was the second guy. And then people like B.B. came after that. Um, so he really kind of liked that. And he didn't like be call, call, called a blues player because that all that, um, you know, Elmore James and, you know, all, Albert King and stuff came after Gate. And he... Um, First of all, he, he played more than that. He played regional music, Texas country, and, you know, Louisiana Cajun and Zydeco because he played fiddle, too. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing. And, you know, the other thing was is that he kind of looked at it as kind of like an uneducated view of blues. And the final thing about it was is that at a certain point in Gates' career, he was the top of the heap. And he kind of got knocked off the top of the heap when people like um, Bobby Bland came out. Because uh, remember that Gate was was a Texas guitarist on the Peacock label. Don Roby started the Duke label and put out Bobby Bland, who's more of a crooner, mm -hmm. and started knocking Gate off the off the heap. Um, Muddy Waters and the whole Chicago scene started coming about because he was there before all of that. And, and then the rise of B.B. King. And B.B. was out of Memphis. And um, the, all these other artists were kind of like knocking him down, a pe not knocking him down a peg, but were rising above him. And like everything else in the music industry, you, today's flavor is, is only as long as you have a hit out there, right. you know. And he started to fall back a little bit. And I think there was a certain amount of a little bit of a jealousy, a little bit of a competitive thing, you know, but he always had that thing about some of, ab about that. And um, he, like a lot of young guitar players, he would always criticize that are trying to sound too much like BB or T-Bone or Albert King or something like that, which is, you know, in my eyes, when you emulate a style you know it part of it is is that yeah you're copying it but that's where you're feeling it mm -hmm. not everybody can create an original thing and he would always be taught he would always talk about that like that you'd have to you know try to try to make your own sound and then like we hear like some guitar player that was not doing that and he's like i don't get it i don't know what what is this stuff you know and it's right. like you look you're complaining that everybody's trying to sound like bb and t-bone and then when somebody's doing something totally unique in the blues you're like you don't get it you know and he he was that kind of guy do you think his versatility got in the way it did it did because well the whole thing got in the way um we used to say that he would shoot himself in the foot and the reason being is because there was a, a world and a community out there that was out there ready to embrace Gate and, and promote him and follow him, but it has the blues moniker on it. Mm -hmm. And he would always like kind of like be cold, sh he would always cold shoulder that because he, he thought blues was an uneducated style and he didn't want to be considered that. He was considered more. It's like his his when he was asked about his style of music, he called it American music Texas style, and that's why he he named that record American music Texas style. So you know, um, it was an interesting kind of a thing, and 
it was interesting being around that. And through the years, um, Gate and I became very, very good friends. The, everybody in the band was located in the Gulf Coast. We had a sax player from Texas, a drummer from Baton Rouge, a bass player from Mobile, and I lived in New Orleans. Gate lived on the north shore of New Orleans in Slidell, so when Gate wanted to go hear music, he would always call me up, or when Gate wanted to go do something, he would call me up, and I'd meet him somewhere, even if it was just like at a Waffle House for breakfast or something, you know. Um, so we would, we would spend time together when we weren't on the road, and um we we were really good friends and to to you know he had this exterior that he was like you know this tough cowboy from texas kind of thing you know but he was really a marshmallow inside and i i could mess with him all the time about everything and i i, I could definitely handle him to get him to do things i wanted him to do you know? like a lot of times it'd be like you know we'd get into a hotel and it would be like all messed up and we'd be like you know we're sitting on the bus and we're like, oh man, this hotel sucks. Man, what are we gonna do about this? Look, we'll get we'll get gate to we'll get gate on this. And gate would come on and he's like, Well, hi boys, what's going on? It's like, oh gate, this hotel sucks. Why are they putting us up in this place? Man, it's they got this and that. And he'd be like, All right, get get the manager on the phone. Get him on the phone right now. <laughs> and he'd call the manager up at like two o'clock in the morning and he's like, That Jim, you gotta do that. <laughs> we get them all riled up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we, we he was he was definitely you know um he he was definitely a cream puff on the inside and and he was very loyal to his to his band he insisted that the band be on the rec on all his records and all his shows there were there were shows that were going on in europe like the lionel hampton jazz club at the le meridian hotel in paris insisted that all the blues black blues artists have black musicians in the band and gate said no i have my band you either bring my, me and my band or you don't have me we played there many times <laughs> so i mean that was things that gate would do that he he would not compromise himself his music or his band and everything that he he that that we went through we went through together as a band whether it was tough travel um you know crummy hotel rooms anything like that you know i mean gate was always side shoulder to shoulder with us and stood with us and stood by us at all times and when things got tough he paid us extra and you know as much as his management sometimes didn't want to have that happen gate stood up with us and i mean he and he was a family guy that always you know uh, wives and kids and all that kind of stuff were a big thing to him. Um, you know, he was he was a unique guy. What's the greatest lesson you learned from him as a musician? Be yourself. Play dynamically. Um, just all the music I got from him. You know, every everything I play all the time is I can hear the influence of. Every time you play with somebody, you pick up something from them. You, something of them becomes part of you. I can hear the things that I picked up from playing with Kenny, the things I picked up from playing with Gate. Just the way um, he he never played with a pick. He used his fingers, and he said he always he always phrased like like a horn player that that breathes their notes, and that was something that I always have taken with me. And like like for example, in Kenny's show. Uh, for those people that are here, will hear it tonight, um, I get a feature in, in the slow blues where I actually can play dynamically, you know, where I can do things where I can play uh, more expressively with the notes. You know, when you're playing a slow song, you can actually do that. And you can hear it on any of my uh, records that I always think about that, about um, making the music breathe the way a horn player does, where they're not always like you know, full tilt every note all the time, you know, that you actually are making it come out like lyrically. And that, that's something I got from Gate more than anybody else. You know? I wonder, you said that you moved to New Orleans because of Gate when you joined the band. I mean, I think of you as a New Orleans piano player. Yeah. Was that always the case? And you, you said that Gate kind of discouraged you from doing that. Like, uh, if I would have heard you in Boston, um, before you moved down there, would you have been a heavily New Orleans-based piano yeah. player? 
uh, I always played New Orleans piano. I mean, when I was like 22 or something like this, uh, me and a, a couple of other piano players found this this Dr. John like workbook thing. Came with six cassettes and a workbook. We had no money, so one of us bought it. We all chipped in to buy it. It was like twenty dollars, and back in the eighties, that was you know considerable, especially for people that were struggling month to month. And we made cassette copies of everything and photocopied the music. I still have it, um, and that was like my first my first thing. And I remember the first time I heard professor long hair and i was like oh my i was big chief i was like what is this and then i was i i got the the, the dr john stuff and everything was like just listen to long hair listen to fess gotta get do fess i grew up boogie woogie was a big part of what i grew up with and all of this stuff is an extension of boogie woogie you know anytime i was around alan alan tucson i was always like trying to like think of ways I could bleed a little secret out of them and it always came back to the same thing I just wanted to play boogie woogie and play like Professor Longhair and it really that's really what it was and the relationship of boogie woogie and New Orleans piano is directly related there there is no um the only thing is it's just they're a little rhythmically different. And anybody that says they play New Orleans piano and is not a boogie woogie person, they're not playing New Orleans. They're not playing it right. You know, they're just copying. So when you move down to New Orleans, when do you become a New Orleans musician? Well, here's here's how it really went down. When I moved down there, the tour manager, the drummer, and the tour manager's wife, who's the merchandise person in Gates Band. We're living in Nashville. The bass player was in um, uh, Mobile, and Gate was on the North Shore of New Orleans. So they were all like, come to Nashville, man. This is where it's going on. Nashville is it. So I spent a couple of months in Nashville in the summer of 1992, and I was like, I hated it. I just hated it. It wasn't, I felt no connection to it. And I had a I had a cousin that went to Tulane and um, ended up living there, raising his family in New Orleans. So I was I called him up. I was like, "Look, I'm I'm really bumming down here, uh, uh, over here. Can, can I come and stay?" And he's like, "Yeah, come on. I got a I got a house, an extra bedroom. You can stay. The kids are here. You know, blah blah blah. Come on." So I went down to New Orleans, and it just was like instantaneous. All the music I loved, all the stuff I was I was playing up in Boston. I played a lot of New Orleans music up in Boston in my band up there, but um, everything I was doing, it was everywhere down there, and it was just like instantaneous. So, you know, I mean, for the first year from 92 until... Um, 92 and 93 I lived with my cousin and then 94 I got my own place and 94 I was um I started working with um local New Orleans musicians and I met a guy that was playing uh he played with a lot of people and he he got me for all the stuff he couldn't do and one of the things that he the main two people that I started working with was a woman named Marva Wright and a guitar player that people might know of named Brian Lee. Um, and I worked with Brian and Marva. I went to Australia with Marva. I went to um, uh, Brazil with Marva. I did, I did a couple of, I did a record with Marva. I played on Bourbon Street with Brian f like four days a week. And it was between the two of them. And Brian stopped hiring me because I took a gig going to Brazil with Marva for a week and that got it or Australia one of those two and he didn't like that so he was like I got I got to get someone else I was like okay whatever you know um and I just started working with all the New Orleans players down there it's starting around 94 and from then on it's been pretty steadily just always whenever I'm on the road whenever I get off the road I've had work Around somewhere around ninety eight or so, ninety seven or something like that, I started I started working in the restaurant stuff, and doing that, and I still do that. I I play a brunch on Saturdays and Sundays, 
And around 99, 98 or 99, I started playing solo piano at the Maple Leaf. And then I started bringing my own band in there. And I was working my own band at the Maple Leaf and the Funky Butt and a few other places around New Orleans that are not around anymore. And um, I still work at the Maple Leaf. Uh, I finish, uh, we've, we finished tonight at uh, Massey Hall. I fly home tomorrow i get home around noon and then i gotta play at the maple leaf on sunday night because sunday nights is my thing over at the maple leaf so i'll do that and then um i got a couple of sessions next week and then uh playing at at a little cigar bar on wednesday and then i'm doing a show at tipitina's on friday so so like when you look at your schedule when you're home you're like playing everywhere and sometimes more than one gig a day yeah what where does that discipline come from i just you know um actually i'm playing less these days than i have when i was not touring with kenny i i was probably doing about 10 gigs a week um it's just i i just really you know have always you know it's one of these things where when you're coming up you always i gotta get i gotta take everything gotta take everything you know pay the bills you know play with everybody out there got to experience this got to experience that and it's just held over and all of a sudden like for about 15 years I was just working like every day multiple times a day you know and nowadays now that I'm getting a little bit older it's I'm trying to really kind of like um uh schedule in days off just so I can not be working every day and even with that like we finished uh, but we 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 left for this trip on March sixth. Okay, uh, the last trip ended like February twenty sixth or something like that, and um, or twenty fourth. We were home for about ten days. In that ten days, from Wednesday that that weekend in between there, we had one weekend off. From Wednesday till Sunday, in those five days, I worked seven gigs. And then I was off like a few days in the front end, a few days on the back end, and I'm back out for 18 days, you know. And it just, sometimes it's like that, you know. Um, I get home, I'm going to be pretty much working straight through until Sunday, and then I'm off for about three or four days. Back, you know, five five years ago, I, I would be working every day, just literally every day, and maybe one day off. When, when, when Katrina happened, I guess I, I, I should ask you, how that affected you but I guess one of the greatest things was Gate passed away soon after that well he, he had cancer right and he had stopped working at the beginning of 2005 he kind of like re- resurfaced again like he's he, I, I was visiting him pretty regularly and he looked he was like he was down mm-hmm. we thought it was getting close to the end and I hadn't seen him for about, I don't know, about a week or so. And all of a sudden, I'm like playing at the Maple Leaf, and he comes walking in in a full cowboy outfit, you know? And I'm like, am I seeing a ghost or something here? I thought we were getting ready to like, you know, lay him down. And I'm like, no, it was him. And, you know, with, I don't know how many people have experienced the cancer um, tr- situation with end of life, but it goes up and down like that. And we got him up to play Jazz Fest, and we, we got one last Jazz Fest out of him. And then Katrina hit that summer, and um, he, had a, he had a tough because he was, he was in his end days. And um, we got him over to a hospice. They got him over to a hospice f- facility in Austin, and that's where he passed. And it was kind of good because his house got wiped out. I mean, literally, it, the back end of it was over, was on um, piers over Lake Pontchartrain, and it just, the lake surged so much, it just lifted it up and dropped it into the lake, wiped it clear, like mm-hmm. Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, it, you know. And um, for me, I live, my house is uh, about five blocks from the river. New Orleans is shaped like a bowl, so I'm like on the rim. We didn't get any rising water. I just I had you know some roof damage, fence damage, you know, a couple broken windows, a little bit of water in the house, but nothing like the devastation you saw. Did you stay in the city? No, I I evacuated on 
like the day the it like hit in the middle of the night that day that morning we evacuated which was horrible i mean it took us about six or seven hours to get to baton rouge straight crawl not more than 10 miles an hour the whole way but our house wasn't destroyed or flooded or anything like that um so i was able to get back in around christmas I was able to, we got electricity back at our house in the middle of October, so I was able to get things going like new refrigerator and freezer and stuff. You know, um, the suburbs, they were they were opening up, like Jefferson Parish was opening up around the end of September. So I was able to get to a Sears and order some appliances and get them delivered. And it was, you know, it was tough. I was able to get the, the roof tarped so that it wasn't leaking anymore. And then I got some roofers in there. And, you know, um, but by the time... Now, my daughter just had started ninth grade in 2005. So that was a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, she, we had her in uh, St. Mary's Dominican High School in New Orleans. And the school, you got to remember, everybody was out. So there were a lot of teachers from that school that had set up with some sort of school in Baton Rouge, and they were taking kids in after the Baton Rouge school let out at 2.30. So we had Allie going to a, a school about, about a 30-minute drive in each direction. Because you got to remember, Baton Rouge, half of the 200,000 people filled the city, so rush hour was ridiculous. Right. Um, but it was about a half an hour drive each way. So you'd have to half hour there, half hour back. Um, and she was going for school from 2.30 to like 7.30. And when she finished that, and they let out for Christmas vacation, I picked her up. I had all the stuff in our... We, we found a place that we could stay at um, luckily in Baton Rouge, I had the, the, the van pack with the last of the stuff that we had at the, at that place. I picked her up from school and drove into, to New Orleans for the last time. It was a very miserable experience just having to deal with, um, the city being destroyed, working, trying to work, trying to survive financially. Um, not knowing anything about anything. Fortunately, people were setting up gigs for us in different cities. Um, it was similar to the pandemic, except that the pandemic was everywhere. Just mm-hmm. imagine if the pan- pandemic was just in New Orleans and you can go up to Nashville or Memphis and play gigs over there. We, I, I you know, there were people that were setting up gigs for us in New Orleans, uh, in Baton Rouge. They were doing things like things for us to do, um, educational things in schools, you know, anything I could do. But it was it was just miserable, you know. And um, when I finally got back in the city and living there, it was very – I mean, I was back in the city uh, like the, a week after the – the water was still in the city when I was go- going in. Um, my wife had a family member that, that was the general manager of Whole Foods that got us passes. So we were in within a week. And I was able to get in my house and secure everything and make sure. Because, you know, the reports we were getting in Baton Rouge was raping and looting and killing and this and that. So I wanted to get back in there and, first of all, pull some keyboards out. And secondly, um, just secure everything so that it can't be broken into. Right. You know? And I did. And um, uh Then I was going in every, like, once a week or so just to work on things, get things cleaned up at our house and try to find people to work on stuff. And, you know, it was was terrible, though. It was just a really terrible time, you know. And And how is the city now? Oh, it's fine. It's like it never happened, you know. I mean, it's still got its problems, you know. Mm -hmm. Crime crime fluctuates up and down. Um, It's not... We had a kind of a surge about a year or two ago, and it's not as bad as it was. Streets are always in need of attention. Work on streets is very slow, it's, but it's always been like that, you know. Um, all everything is restored, you know. Everything's been restored for years. I don't even think of Katrina or, or any of that kind of stuff anymore, you know. Well, we didn't have the pandemic, so we had other things to worry yeah, about. Yeah, that's that's a whole nother thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so going forward a bit, how did you wind up joining Kenny's band? Um, 
apparently what it was was Kenny's manage his his whole career has been managed uh, by his father. Because mm-hmm. remember, Kenny was a kid. His father, uh, Ken Shepard, is was a radio DJ and a concert promoter, and he pretty much has been guiding Kenny's career um, as a kid. Now it's Kenny and his father and the uh, other manager, a woman named Kristen Forbes, who really direct his career. And they had a keyboard player for a bunch of years, a guy named um, Riley. And um, he ret- he retired from the band. He was an amazing piano player, but he was, he was older and he was having health issues. And he retired from the band and they were going out as a power trio with Noah. So it was a four piece band for a couple of years. And they wanted to add a keyboard player. His father, Ken, is, you know, they're from Shreveport, Louisiana, and they're very wrapped up. His father is very wrapped up in the in the National Recording Academy or the Grammys, mm-hmm. as we know, the Grammy Foundation. And um, he's wrapped up in the whole chapter, and there's a lot of people from New Orleans. And when they were looking for a piano player, they wanted someone from New Orleans, apparently. And they asked a few people, and my name fell out of the hat with several people. And um, one of them, my friend Reed Wick, called me up, and he was like, you know, Kenny Wayne Shepherd's looking for a piano player, and um, would you be interested? And at the time, I had my, my band with uh, Walter Wolfman Washington and Russell Batiste, and that, that was cruising along pretty good, but there was some hiccups going on with that. Walter had some new management that was making it a little bit difficult. And, you know, I thought about it and I'm like, well, gee, do I want to get in? You know, I didn't, I wasn't like, I I remember Kenny when he came up because it was like this sensation about him, but I had no idea where his career is or what has been. And I was thinking, well, gee, you know, do I want to get in, you know, vans and ride around the country, you know, doing this kind of thing. And like, I looked at his. I looked him up. I did some research. And I'm like, hmm. He's not in vans. <laughs> he's not playing like you know van van venues. He's playing concert halls, and he sold a few records too. There's three platinum records and a gold record. This could be a little bit interesting. And I did more research, and I'm realizing that that he's definitely got quite the career going. And then I started listening a little to some of the music, and I'm like. This could be a really good fit for me, you know. So I said, I told Reed, I said, yeah, put my name out there. Let them know I'm interested. And um, about a week later, Kristen called me up. He said, look, we want to try you out. Uh, I said, this was, I remember it was a Monday night. I was on my way to a gig and it was raining real hard. And uh, she called me up and I had a nice conversation with her. I said, well, so uh, what's the deal here? Okay, well, we'll fly you out on Thursday. We have a show in friday in syracuse I'm like okay that'll work for me i don't have anything i can i can clear my schedule to do that um is there a like a book of charts or something he said no we'll send you a, a youtube link to one of our most recent concerts with a keyboard player just, just learn the whole show <laughs> i was like okay that's a little bit of a challenge so i had tuesday and wednesday to sit in shed and learn the show. I flew out on Thursday. Right. How easy is that, or how difficult is that to? Incredibly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For me, just to to remember all the little intricacies. Right. And I don't want I, you know. Normally, I would write it all out and like um, have it so I'd have it. You know, I know exactly what's happening in every song. But this is a concert band. I don't want to have a, a book in front of me. I wanted to really like learn it. So. Um, I wrote little crypt notes on a, on a set on a set list. Like I printed out the set list and I wrote like, okay, this is in this key. The bridge goes to this, just so I'd have some sort of like why this song is different than the other song kind of thing. So we we flew out. I flew out on Thursday and I'm with a whole bunch of people that I don't know at all. And I'm like, okay, you know, um, I kind of knew the sound engineer. The sound engineer front of house guy was from New Orleans, and I'm like. Well, what do I do here? Do I like you know have to go and set up gear? And he's like, no, 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 no. It's not like that at all. We take care of everything. All you do is play, because no one was telling me anything. Right. 
So I go and I play the show and I get off the stage and, you know, I'm gathering my stuff together and uh, uh, we go into the dressing room and Kenny's in there and he's like, so what do you think? You want to join the band? And that was like the really the first thing he's actually said to me the whole weekend. He's uh, out of just like, hey, how how you doing? You know, and I was like, really? He goes, yeah, man, we, we love it. It's cool. We want you. And I was like, yeah, let's do this. So, you know, I joined the band and um time goes on and uh i said to him i was like now i'm in the band and now I'm, i know everybody and we're all comfortable with, uh, with well, each how other how long does it take for you to reach that point of being all comfortable with the band? one tour <laughs> yeah. okay. you go out on the road with a bunch of guys for a few weeks and it's like you you're, you're pretty comfortable okay also when you played that first gig did you did you know like did you have that same feeling that it was working out and i had a great time I mean, it felt great to me. Um, I was, first of all, we're, we're in Syracuse, New York, playing some sort of outdoor downtown, like they closed off the streets in a square kind of thing. And literally it was like, you know, um, maybe 10,000 people, you know, and the only person on the bill was this was this band. Um, I, don't, I can't remember if there was an opener or not, but we were the band. And I was like... I was pretty jazzed about it, you know. So after it was all said and done, and, you know, and I'm pretty comfortable with everyone, I was, like, in the room with Kenny and Noah. I was like, so, you know, what was that? You know, th that was, like, kind of, like, brutal to do that to me, you know. You know, two days and, you know, no charts in front of 10,000 people. And Kenny was like, well, we kind of knew that we wanted you. We just had to make sure... You, um, well, I'll put it. I'll put it mildly. We wanted to make sure you could pass the a hole test. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to make sure you were a nice guy. You know that because you're out here on the road with people, and we wanted to make sure that you were like just the chemistry was right on the personality level. We didn't want to. You know, we don't want to bring in anybody that's like you know going to be a drinker or a drugger or egoed out like you know i have to have this and i have to do that we want people that are easy to get along with and that are easy to work with you know and but they could tell that from like one gig they from from the two days that we were together that was it that's wow. all they were that's all they really needed and you know i was like well that's cool you know i mean i i get that because you know you're out there after working on the road with people for years, having one toxic individual in the environment is like a cancer. And it can really um, disrupt the entire um, flow of everything and everybody around you to the point where, like, you just, nobody is, you know, and, and it breeds so that, like, you have one complainer out there, and before before any time, everybody's you know complaining about everything. Right, and you really it's a real struggle to um, go day to day with everything we have to endure, and everything that that goes on out here, whether it's bad weather, whether it's like you know rough load ins or rough roads or. You know, catering isn't what it's supposed to be or anything like that. Anything like that, you know, I mean, it can it can breed when you have someone that's constantly like complaining about it. So, you know, we we all talk about this, about making a conscious effort to be positive about stuff and to not be um, complaining unless it's really super, you know, you know, pick your battles about that because. You know, you, you're sitting there complaining about every little thing, and it's just all it's doing is is just making it, you know, unbearable for everybody, and it breeds, you know. And you don't want that kind of toxic personality. And fortunately, in, in Kenny's band, you know, everybody is, is really level-headed, and there's really not anybody that complains about anything. And, you know, we're all pretty happy that we're here and for me right now there if i'm if i'm not feeling that way about anything i won't i won't do it you mm -hmm. know there's no gig that i have to do anymore in my life and there's no situation that i'm ever going to put myself in where i feel 
any any less appreciated or any uh, uncomfortable about what what it requires to do the gig. And I'm I, I turn down stuff now where I would normally be like I'll take everything, take everything. There's people I just I don't want to work with them just because I just don't have fun when I do it, you know. And I'm enjoying myself, and I feel that everybody on that stage is in the same situation. That we're all here because we really want to be, and it's not just a job, you know. Um, and that's the kind of uh, that's what I want to be doing, you know. If I got to be in a band where there's people that are just would rather be doing anything but that, it's not for me, you know. My final question. I mean, you've had a career working with many of the giants who you've talked about, whether it be Alan Toussaint or Dr. John or Mavis Staples, Kenny Wayne Shepherd. What is it about you, other than not being an a-hole, that that gets you into these situations and allows you to work with these people? Well, um, apparently I'm a good fit for certain situations. Um, I think musically I'm qualified to a, to a point, you know. Um, one of my assets is is that I can play piano and I can play organ. A lot of piano players struggle on organ. Um, it's not as common to find people that can do both. Um, I don't know if it's equally as well, um, but I mean, I feel very comfortable on both. I don't play pedals on organ, um, I can do left hand though. I can do. I've done left hand organ trios for fifteen plus years. Um, plus, I've done piano trios where I'm a straight up boogie woogie kind of thing without a bass player. So I can work without bass players. But most of the bands that I get hired for are with bass players. So I mean, that's not even um, something that comes up. But I mean, I can. I can play comfortably on organ. I can play comfortably on piano, so that's an asset. Um, clearly, I can learn the parts, and um, I'd like to think I'm easy to work with. You know, one thing Kenny once said to me is like one of one of the things he likes about me is is like we only have to dis- discuss something once. Mm-hmm. You know, if he tells me he wants it different, it's done. You know, and. And it's okay to to, to um, hear things differently. Um, I'm open. You know, there's a lot of people that it's they think what they're doing is um, it's the best thing ever and don't want to hear other people's ideas. For me, that's not how you grow. And especially when I'm working for someone else, if I'm working for Kenny Wayne Shepherd. I'm playing his music. If he wants me to play it a little less this way or a little bit more that way or piano instead of organ or organ instead of piano, it's it's his music. I'm there. That's what I'm there to do, you mm-hmm. know. Um, so that's that's kind of like, you know, a good thing about it. And, you know, I, I come in and play the part. And I guess I can do that well enough so that people call me back for it, you know. Um the situations that I don't get called back for, I'm not a good fit for it. You right. know, that's the only way I can describe it. And I don't, uh, I, you know, there's a lot of I don't get a lot of situations where I don't get called back because I don't get considered for those situations. You know, but um, you know, it happens from time to time that I don't feel like I'm the right guy for that situation. But most of the time, if I get called, it's because they. They know who I am, and th- at least as I've gotten older, you know, I mean, um, as you get older and people, especially with the internet, there's plenty of things to see who I am, you know. Uh, you know, like, for example, with Kenny, they, they did their research. They knew what I was doing musically would be a good fit for what they want, you know. But there's, just because you hear a guy play like that doesn't mean that, that they're going to be able to fit into what your sound, what you need from them for the sound. So, you know, for the most part, I can, I feel I can do that, you know. And that's why I get called. Yeah, and Walt deservedly so. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing that. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure talking. <laughs>